Hello and welcome to Future Squared. Stephen Hawking once said that intelligence is the ability to adapt to change, so let's adapt. My name is Steve Glaveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with preeminent thought leaders from a variety of fields to help you think in a multidisciplinary way, kick goals in your professional and personal life, and better navigate what is fast becoming a brave new world. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation accelerator that works with organizations to unlock their people's latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If you need help driving your organization's innovation strategy, visit collectivecampus.io. And without further ado, come with me if you want to live. So what would you rather have? Would you rather buy 100,000 tickets worth one euro or would you buy one ticket worth 100,000 euros, right? Obviously, it makes more sense to buy more more tickets, cheaper tickets, right? Because it's going to increase your chances of success. This episode is brought to you by Innovators Sydney. The Global Corporate Innovation Conference is making its way down under on 25, 26 and 27 September. You can catch speakers such as Scott Anthony from Innersight, Dan Toma, author of the Corporate Startup Playbook, Stefan Lindegaard, as well as yours truly, amongst a wealth of other speakers. Future Squared listeners can get 15% off tickets simply by using the code 8-STEVE during checkout. And I'll add that to the show notes for new listeners. For more info and to secure your seat, Simply visit innovators.co forward slash Sydney. That's I-N-N-O-V-8-R-S dot co forward slash Sydney. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 276 with Dan Toma. Dan is the co-author of The Corporate Startup, How Established Companies Can Develop Successful Innovation Ecosystems. Puzzled by the questions, why are innovative products mainly launched by startups, Tomo focuses on enterprise innovation strategy, specifically on the changes blue chip organizations need to make to allow for new ventures to be built in a corporate setting. And he's worked with the likes of Deutsche Telekom, Bosch, Jaguar, Bayer, John Deere, and Allianz. We riffed on all things corporate innovation, viable alternatives to common pitfalls, and given Dan's Romanian heritage, the 1994 Romanian World Cup team. On corporate innovation, expect to learn about one, an innovation thesis and why your company needs one, two, why it's imperative to get the plumbing right by building an innovation ecosystem, and three, the importance of getting the metrics right and going beyond mere activity metrics to what Dan calls impact metrics. We covered a lot more ground in this conversation that will be of serious interest to entrepreneurs. So sit back, relax, enjoy your walk, workout, or wherever you happen to be listening to this for my conversation with yet another critical thinker on the topic of corporate innovation and on thriving under conditions of uncertainty, Dan Toma. Welcome to the show, Dan. Hi, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. Um, whereabouts are you joining me? Are you in Germany at the moment? or I, I'm traveling a lot. I'm usually based in Germany, but now I'm calling in from Norway. Ah, beautiful. Nice and cold up there at the moment or, or a little bit warm being summer? Uh, yeah, it's the end of the summer now. So you see, you see, the, you see the, the, the winter setting in, basically the fall setting in. Yeah. Uh, and you see it basically in the fact that you no longer have that long daylight as you used to have during the summer. Yeah, well, the, the sun goes down at something like 11 or 11 p.m. or midnight or something crazy like that. Yeah, during the summer, yeah. But now, now it's starting to, to get lower and lower towards, towards 6 or 7. And um, in winter, probably it's going to be around 3 or 4 yeah. p.m. Beautiful, beautiful. And um, you're originally from Romania. Yeah, I was, uh, was born there. I, uh, I, I lived in a lot of countries, but uh, now I actually reside in, uh, in Germany for yeah. about seven years now or eight. <laughs> Whenever I meet someone from Romania, Dan, I can't help but bring up the country's 94 World Cup team and the one and only Georgia Haji and, of course, his brilliant free kicks. <laughs> 
<laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what made us famous. Now, now it seems that we're very good in tennis, yep. women's tennis specifically. But uh, yes, everybody remembers that that uh, national team. Fantastic team and fantastic jersey. Um, so, look, Dan. Obviously, we're not here to talk about Georgia Haji and, and the '94 USA team. Although I could talk about that for an hour. Um, we're here to talk about corporate innovation. Um, a book you've released um, called "The Corporate Startup." Um, but before we get into that, I'd love for you to tell our audience a little bit about the Dan Toma backstory, um, how you got to work with corporations as large as Bayer and Deutsche Telekom on their innovation strategies. Sounds good, yeah. Uh, well, I started, off, I started off being an entrepreneur, so I had a couple of, a couple of companies of, uh, of my own, and then I started working with various other startups, either as an employee of those companies or from an advisor position. And then, um, and then I moved up the ladder, if you want. Mm-hmm. So I got interested in, okay, how do, we, how do we manage more than one startup? And I got involved with accelerators. And uh, in that position, I spent uh, spend a good amount of time in, in Southeast Asia and Vietnam, where, where I helped set up uh, one of the largest accelerator programs in the country, and then uh, the lessons learned from there were, were taken by by other other programs in the region. Uh, very interesting stuff, as it was part of an uh, economic aid program. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, so if you if you do it to twenty startups, let's see what's what's the next big thing where innovation uh, where innovation is uh, is being developed. And uh, obviously, it's corporations. So um, I've spent I spent a good amount of time with uh, with Deutsche Telekom. That's basically where where the corporate startup was. Uh, was forged, if you want, mm-hmm. in the, in the fires of Deutsche Telekom. Uh, so um, yeah, I was I was always I was always passionate about the innovation. I was always curious about why, why why do products that I use and love are mainly launched by by startups, free people in a garage with almost no resources when. The corporations on the other on the other side have have plenty of resources, but it seems that they are not able to launch those products. Right? Yeah. For me, it it looked very paradoxical from the outside of course being in and working with working with some very large established organizations i started realizing what what are the issues and one thing led to the other and together with uh, other two super smart individuals i um i started this project a corporate startup mm-hmm. and uh, we launched a book in march 2017 yep and uh, we've been we've been writing it actually since end of 2013. So it was it was a long it was a long journey, if you want. And uh, but uh, no, it was um, well well received book. I'm not I'm not trying I'm not trying to 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 make any publicity for the book. But it was very very well received actually. I was not expecting it to to get that much traction. I think this year in February, British Library and uh, and Charter Management Institute said that it's uh, management book of the year 2018 for. Uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. So I guess that says something about the quality there. Yeah, definitely. And um, you know, I, I did get an opportunity to read through the book, and it, it does cover off on a lot of the the question marks that large organizations have, a lot of the pitfalls that they fall into. And it's also just an enjoyable read the way it's presented with lots of you know images and um, dotted lines and all sorts of stuff. You know, speech bubbles everywhere. Um, it's <laughs> not just walls of text, which is. Um, a refreshing change from a lot of the books that I, I tend to read. Um, so just on the whole notion of a corporate startup, you know, th- I think years ago, Steve Blank was saying that a startup is not a small version of a large company and, and vice versa. So, I mean, how do you define a corporate startup and how does a corporate startup, say, differ from a startup outside of the building? Right. It's a very good question. I, I don't think there is a clear definition of what a corporate startup is. Or at least I'm trying to. I'm trying not to create one because then people will just take it super dogmatic, as it happened Makes with sense. so many other definitions before. So I'm trying to stay away from that. But uh, for me, basically, the, the biggest difference is uh, is on one hand access to to resource, which obviously. Uh, People within a corporation have more access to more resources than people on the outside. But on the other hand, they are uh, they they have problems when it when it comes to to the to the field where they are allowed to play, right? So within the company, you have to create you have to create ideas that are aligned with with the strategy, at least in mm-hmm. theory, right? Yeah. So you don't don't invest in something uh, which is totally totally not aligned with, uh, with with strategy. Where on the outside, you're pretty much free to do whatever you want. Right. Um, so these are just just from the top of my head, the, 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 the big differences. I think that's that's a key point to make as well, because we see a lot of, um, say, accelerator programs and whatnot being set up. But oftentimes what becomes a bit of an afterthought is that 
real strategic alignment, that business model alignment that can really help um, both the corporate and the startup move forward. Um, because if, if you've got the networks, the domain expertise, the resources, and the business model alignment coming from the big corporate with the talent, the tech, and the speed of the startups, you can achieve a lot more. But if you're just casting a wide net and saying, okay, startups, come show us what you've got. And you know, business model uh, alignment, strategic objective alignment becomes an afterthought, then there's only so much you can really do in those instances. Indeed. I think, I think the biggest problem here is that most of the corporations don't actually have a discipline or they are not disciplined when it comes to their, their innovation strategy. They, most, most of the executives want to innovate. I think there was a, it was a PVC research done last year or actually this year saying that 89% of CEOs uh, consider uh, innovation as, as an important growth engine and they're actively doing something around that. Yeah. The problem is that most of the time, whenever whenever you talk about innovation, some people associate it with, with, with people in shorts or mm-hmm. in Converse and, you know, beanbags and color post-it notes on the wall. Yeah. Um, actually, there's more management and discipline to innovation uh, than, than there is, than there is fluff. And uh, I think it, I think it needs to, it, Innovation as as a concept, innovation as as a doctrine of gro- growth, if you want, uh, deserves to have its place there in, in the management board, together with all the other doctrines, together with all the other uh, growth options. Yeah, yeah, and be managed accordingly. Mm-hmm. Be managed in a pragmatic and, and disciplined way, as uh, as my author is always saying: is innovation is like equals management. Exactly. And I couldn't have put that better myself. Um, the conversation I had last week with Larry Keeley from Dublin also echoed those sentiments that creativity and innovation are not the same thing. So let's stop confusing, you know, design sprints and beanbags and, and, you know, throwing post-it notes up on the wall with innovation. I mean, that's part of it, but innovation is a lot more about discipline than it is about the chaos of creativity. And, um, in, in your book, you've proposed this, notion of an innovation thesis. Why yeah. do companies need an innovation thesis? And more importantly, what is it? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think it's one of the concepts that, uh, that we're missing in the corporate, uh, in the corporate uh, innovation world before, before the book. Uh, it's not something new. So it's not something that we created based only on, on, our, on, on, our, on our thought leadership capability, if you want. Uh, but uh, basically, it's a concept that's been taken or, or important from, from the venture capital world. Every, every big venture capital company has an investment thesis. Mm. Basically, an investment thesis is a statement saying where they're going to invest and where they're not going to invest. You know, try to add that, that pragmatism, try to add that discipline to their investment strategy. Yeah. In the same way, large corporations need to have in an innovation thesis or multiple innovation thesis. If, if you're a large organization in pharma, for example, or, or in manufacturing, where you actually have multiple business units addressing different customer needs and different, different problems in different segments, you might, you might need to have more than one innovation thesis. So basically, it's a document that's going to tell you that you should invest in these ideas and not invest in others. It's going to help uh, the, the people understand what ideas they are allowed to come up with mm-hmm. and what ideas are going to be discarded for not being aligned with, with the vision and with, with the goals of, uh, of, um, of the corporation. It's, uh, it's basically a document that is, are, is going to guide the investment decisions of, um, of, um, of that company. Yeah. It's not a law. It's not a law. And this is something really important. I want to stress out that once you create it, it's not just going to stay on the wall and then you're going to, you're going to, you're going to look at its beauty and admire it. Yeah. Uh, you, you actually have to use it. And not just that, but, but through the startups that you're creating, through the ideas that you're creating, through the startups you're, you're investing in, you're going to validate if what you just put in the, in, in the thesis is correct or not. And in the next, and in the next cycle, in six months, in three months, or in one year, you have to revise your thesis based on that customer input and see where are you going to invest next year. Yeah, and that thesis, like you said, it needs to adapt and roll with the punches because the world outside the building is often moving than the world inside the building. So the thesis has to be a, sure. a living, breathing uh, object. Um, and, and I guess without a thesis, the risk is that companies – fall into the trap that so many fall into now, which is that 
ideas that are often selected for, say, funding um, are selected based on, you know, the highest paid person's opinion or a popularity contest of sorts or some sort of, um, you know, flashy pitch event rather than yeah. strategic alignment, um, validation of some of the business model assumptions and, and some of those clear sort of metrics that will, can help guide that, that path forward. Recently, recently, I was working with uh, I was working with a manufacturing uh, co- company. I'm not going to to name it. Mm-hmm. Very well established manufacturing company, and uh, they they were they were trying to figure out a a, a project or or a product, if you want, right? I mean, it's been it's been uh, it's been changing hands from one department to the other, and they were making little progress in terms of validating the concept. Not that the concept was was bad. It was just using a lot of new technologies like like RFID and and, and wearable technologies, right? But at one point, after about eight months, it was killed from somebody very high up for a simple reason, not aligned with strategy. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the project was not aligned with strategy. But if the company would have had an innovation thesis beforehand, they wouldn't have invested in that particular technology to begin with. So basically, having an innovation thesis would have saved them eight months of work on a team of four people. So imagine how, how, what's the overhead there, right? And this was just one project. Imagine how many other projects that they're, they're working on are not aligned with strategy. And at one point, those projects will ask for budgeting. And when they ask for budgeting, somebody will probably just kill them because they've just been created because of a, of a trend or because somebody's ambition or, or whatnot. Yeah, I could not agree more on that. And I guess on the other side of that, you have senior management pulling the plug on a project, say, eight months in, not because it doesn't align with strategy, but because there's no sort of clear ROI, and that's a whole different conversation. That's another, that's another step, right? That's another step um, in, uh, in, in the methodology we put forward, right? So this is, so first of all, you have to have alignment with strategy to get, to get the green light to start moving. But then it's a matter of how do you measure the progress, what's happening in the process of, of validating that idea. And that's, where, that's when we have to talk about the discipline of innovation. That's when we talk about creating an actual system mm-hmm. that allows even for the worst player in the system to perform. Yeah, and and so that system you talk about in the book, I mean, your book is ultimately divided um, into two parts, building an innovation ecosystem and the practice of innovation. And this this is something that um, you know I come I discuss oftentimes with my clients as well that you know it's one thing to talk about innovation it's another to train people in you know different methodologies but ultimately you've got to have the plumbing right you've got to have that ecosystem that ultimately creates or gets people to exhibit those innovative behaviors like rapid experimentation and trying lots of different things. Right. Um, whereas if somebody has an idea and, you know, the old case study that I like to use, they have an idea, they need to complete a business case, they need to project the ROI, the payback period, seven people need to sign off on it. Six months later, maybe you get a bit of funding to try something. And again, the metrics you're using to evaluate success, uh, trailing metrics like revenue, as opposed to some of those leading indicators like can we validate the problem here first and foremost? So, I mean, what kind of things should companies be thinking about when it comes to building that that layer, that innovation ecosystem? It's it's very important. So, basically, the, the way the way I describe it is basically governance, right? It's basically institutionalizing the practice of innovation. And I have a very good example there. I was uh, was working with uh, with, uh, with 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 the client in in, um, in in healthcare, and uh, to get together with a colleague of mine, we spent we spent some time with one of their teams. I think we spent about eight or nine months and we took that that particular product team from from a concept idea all the way to a prototype that was running in a pilot market and it took us eight eight to nine months to do it so I, can't, I can't remember it was last year uh the idea is that uh, after these eight months we uh, we finished our um our contract with the company we were we were hired just for that period to get to get the product team to the pilot the pilot was quite successful actually right so we have a lot of interesting metrics showing showing engagement in that particular market well i can tell you that it took that product team five months to set up another conversation with another potential internal investor to further invest in that idea. Mm. And basically what this was telling me, if, if, it, took, if it took us f- four months to validate and another four to five to create the pilot, and it took them four months to set up a meeting, it means that their governance system is faulty. If, if it takes you longer to, to take a decision on moving forward or not, longer than it takes you to validate the concept, you have a problem in your governance, right? 
Yeah. And that governance is made up of, of a lot of things, right? It's made up of, of, of your innovation accounting system, right? How do you measure innovation? How do you write the, how do you ask the right question at the right time in the product life cycle? It goes into the product life cycle and saying, hey, we should not measure our products based on a one size fits all framework. We should actually be more attentive to the stages a product is going through, right? In in the VC world, in the startup world, everybody knows about problem solution fit, product market fit, yeah. and, and all that jazz. In, uh, in a corporation, it's basically one size fits all. They measure everything with the same with the same yardstick that they use to measure uh, mature businesses. I'm not saying this is wrong, but it, it, it's wrong in the perspective of of measuring somebody that just launched yesterday with the same yardstick that you're measuring somebody that has been in the market for 20 years, right? So actually optimizing for, for efficiency, because this is what's happening here, right? They're optimizing for efficiency. is no longer efficient. Yeah. It's just simply no longer efficient. So we need to talk about effectiveness of the system more about more than more than about the efficiency of a system. Mm, yeah, exactly. And uh, we see things come up all the time where organizations may run something like an idea challenge. And then from that one idea may be selected for incubation, like you've said, and then that will go through the, the governance structures, which are more conducive to you know, established core business models, and it can take months just to get anything out the door. Um, and similarly, you just mentioned VCs and how they have problems, solution fit, product market fit, and at different stages of that funnel, you've got different metrics to determine whether or not Indeed. the startup's on the right track and whether or not they receive some follow-on funding. Um, but the other thing that VCs do is they cast a very wide net. I mean, every year they're tracking thousands of startups. They might invest in you know, 20, and of those 20, two are successful. Um, whereas in the corporate world, you might make two or three investments on sort of quote unquote disruptive ideas, expecting that they'll be successful. And then you scratch your head wondering why they're not. So, I mean, what have you uh, proposed in this space in so far as taking some lessons from VC um, investing and casting the wider net um, as part of that innovation ecosystem. It's it's definitely innovation is definitely a, a numbers game. I keep I keep telling people uh, I keep telling people that we we need to invest more. I'm using a metaphor whenever I'm working with with executives. I'm always using this metaphor of of the lottery. So I give them an option. You can uh, you can buy one ticket worth one euro, mm-hmm. right? Or you can buy you can buy tickets worth worth one euro, or you can buy one uh, one ticket worth one hundred thousand euros, right? Uh, the, the, there is absolutely no difference in between the two tickets. Uh, the only, I mean, the the chance of you succeeding, the the chance of you winning that that gold pot is exactly the same, mm-hmm. and uh, that uh, that's exactly the same gold pot, right? Independent of, uh, of 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 the price of the ticket. So, what would you rather have? Would you rather Buy 100,000 tickets worth one euro, or would you buy one ticket worth 100,000 euros? Right. Obviously, it makes more sense to buy more more tickets, cheaper tickets, right? Because it's going to increase your chances of success. So I'm, I'm trying to convince them that innovation happens at scale, and I'm I'm a firm believer that that. And, and we kind of like see this trend happening. I've I've been preaching about it uh, since 2015. Yep. That the that the accelerator model that a lot of companies go go for uh, is not sustainable. I have nothing against the accelerator model. It serves its purpose, right? Mm-hmm. But you cannot rely your entire innovation effort on having a, a lab. Why? Because the lab has a tiny capacity, right? You have a lot of bottlenecks in terms in terms of your capabilities in terms of in terms of the capacity floor space. Floor space is an actual problem, right? So you can't play innovation at scale if you don't do that. So my 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 suggestion for them is like, yeah, keep the lab, explore really, really future tech stuff there, but allow for innovation to happen within the business units, within each each segment. Don't don't create this one island and you throw people there because you're basically creating creating a bottleneck. And uh, of course, it requires a lot of training on management side. It requires a lot of change on uh, on the corporate side in terms of their capabilities, right? And uh, and in terms of their processes. And it requires a lot of a lot of training on the people to to basically teach them how to generate new ideas, teach them how to how to experiment, teach them how to how to bring uh, bring products to market. Yeah, well, very well said. And um, I guess on the accelerator side, if organizations are running accelerators, then before they get to that incubation stage, 
it's about casting a very wide net like VCs do and not just putting out the uh, call to call for applications and incubating the first 10 ideas that you get. But hey, let's have a thousand ideas come through. Let's have them complete business model canvases. Let's have them validate some of their assumptions. And then based on all these leading indicators, we'll then decide which 10 we might incubate. But even then, maybe you make it a four-week program so that you fail fast and you make a decision on uh, promoting some of the other ideas that come through rather than the first 10 that come by your your desk. So there's two things here. So first of all, is just reading some research. There's uh, there's about 64.5 percent of of, uh, of startups mm-hmm. VCs invest in return in between zero and one time their initial investment. Mm-hmm. So basically, 64.5 percent of the startups are at the very best breaking even. Yep. Right. So I mean, you can't you can't you can't beat the VC world, in my opinion. Right. Uh, or, or at least if you do, you're not going to beat them by, by huge margins. So probably you're going to get like something like 50% or, or 40%, right? That's, uh, that's one. And actually, um, since we've done this research, if, uh, if, uh, if the listeners go to the corporatestartupbook.com website, mm-hmm. we have there a tool which allows them to uh, state how much profit they want to make, hit enter, and uh, out pops the number of, of startups they need to invest in. And they can do it in, in reverse order saying, well, we are going to invest X amount of money in X amount of ideas. Let's see what is our probable, um, probable ROI. Uh, I'm not saying that model is, uh, is, is the one that they should pass their decisions, uh, decisions on, right? their investment decisions on, but at least it's going to give them a, a good ballpark number of what they need to do. And another issue here is that large organizations do growth in percentages, right? Mm -hmm. And the bigger you are, the the more difficult it is to reach that percentage goal, numerical, numerical goal, right? So if it's one, what's one thing to say, I'm going to grow 2% if I'm worth a hundred million. And it's another thing to say, I'm going to grow 2% if I'm a hundred billion. Yeah. Right. And and then the amount the amount of startups you need to create in order to reach that two percent when you're a hundred billion is way higher than the amount of startups you need to invest in when you're just a hundred million. Yeah, yeah, and that's something that uh, Clayton Christensen talked about in the Innovators Dilemma: those growth targets, and if you're always optimizing just to grow by say five percent, um, whether it's investing in startups or whether it's investing in that disruptive innovation internally, um, you're probably not going to get those returns in the you know the first three months or the first twelve months even of exploring those ideas. So you need to be using different metrics, and you need to be thinking for the long term um, without compromising your core business. And, and that's one thing that I think I, I try to stress on this show is that yes invest in disruptive innovation, you need to be doing this stuff. The world is changing, but don't do it at the expense of your core business. And and we saw last year what happened with um, Jeffrey Immelt. And whenever I ask people um, in the space, even Alex Osterwelder, who was on the show a few weeks ago, around the fact that GE were investing a lot in you know lean startup training and changing the culture and everything else to support experimentation. But it seemed to, at least as far as the markets are concerned, come at the expense of the core business. And ultimately, it resulted in a change in leadership at the top. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to go into I don't want to go into the G story because I don't think anybody anybody knows what exactly what, happened what happened there. Happened there, yeah, right. I have a lot of respect for for Eric and the work that uh, that he's done with with G. I think it was amazing just to just to show that Definitely. large corporations can can do it. Uh, I personally don't know what what the story was. I I, I wrote an article about it immediately, immediately after, or actually during Same. during that, yep. that that particular crisis. Um, I, I believe there there were a lot of things there, like um, also the fact that uh, that the 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 stock market, right, Wall Street doesn't have the stomach to put up with with innovation, and you can actually see it now in the news with uh, with Tesla, with with uh, Elon Musk trying to take Tesla away from 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 the stock market, right, right, take it down from the stock market mm-hmm. for. Pre- Pretty much the same reason, like he can't he can't innovate while while being listed. But that's that's a conversation altogether, and I'm not trying to to wage war now with <laughs> with with Wall Street and the financial analysts. And I'm I'm not in a position to do that, and I don't want to do it, frankly. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think Eric Reese also, I'm not sure if he's still pursuing it, but a couple of years ago, um, he came out publicly and said he wanted to help establish a long-term stock exchange where investments um, are based on, say, three-year returns, five-year returns, and companies are then given the freedom to to plan for the long-term rather than be held mercy by you know the short-term desires of, of shareholders. Uh, I, th- I think he's still doing it, and that's very interesting. So I, I done mul- I've, I've done some research on this topic. I was I was very interested in uh, in, uh, in innovation accounting, and I and I still am um, very passionate about the topic. And I and I realized two things here, and uh, I was basically combining two passions on my innovation accounting with uh, with psychology. And uh, I, I came to I came to learn the fact that uh, there is a reason for uh, for companies not having a uh, diverse enough um, let, let's say, let's say, pool of people, right? So you don't see a lot of women there. You don't see a lot of cognitive diversity happening, right? I mean, there's everybody graduated kind of like the same university, and they were pretty much from the same part of the country or or whatnot. Um, what's really interesting, and how does this connect to innovation accounting? The topic with, that we're we're discussing now is that uh, basically it's proven in research that teams that are homogeneous, right? That the teams that are not diverse. Mm-hmm are better at, at delivering short-term predictable results. Yeah. Yes, the results are marginal, but they are very good at hitting those targets. Whether diverse teams, they need to go through a lot of failures to, to deliver some results. They're not going to be predictable in any way. They're not going to be short-term. But yes, the results they deliver are breakthrough. I mean, they're they are talking about 10 times, 20 times more than, than a homogeneous team in term in terms of return in terms of return right so if you have a company which is listed if you have a company which is evaluated against short term predictable results mm-hmm. then it makes a lot of sense for them to hire for a homogeneous teams because those are the teams that are going to be able to deliver on those results right so so one thing leads to the other we need to understand the complexity of the world we live in right not just saying oh we want diversity or we want innovation we need to understand what what we want right like okay if we want diversity we need to change the way we measure our companies because that is going to impact the way we um the the, the way we uh output innovation, right? Yeah. And if we want innovation, we need to understand what type of innovation we want, right? Innovation is not a catch-all phrase, right? And it's, it's, it's very, very shallow for us to say that corporations are bad at innovation because they are not. They are very good at sustainable innovation, all of them. And that's, 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 that's in caps and highlighted. Innova- innovation, sustainable innovation is something that all corporations are good at. When it comes to disruptive innovation, when it comes to, to adjacencies, right, this is where things get shaky for them. But in order for them to do that, we need to understand the entire complexity of the environment they play in. Yeah, and I think you make an absolutely great point there because we we see so many senior executives get up at town hall meetings and proclaim to the world, be innovative, be bold. Um, of course, they don't take steps to create an innovation ecosystem so people can actually be innovative, but it, it goes beyond that because you, you've just said that your work on innovation accounting drew on psychology as well. And even if you look at neuroscience, um, you know, the – People that tend to run firms, your, say, sustainable innovation thinkers who just like to execute, they tend to be more conservative thinking. They have more heightened amygdalas, which means they tend to avoid uh, uncertainty, whereas your entrepreneurs and whatnot, your entrepreneurial thinkers, from what I've read about the neurosciences, they tend to be more liberal in their thinking. They tend to have less um, alert amygdalas. Their frontal cortex is more... um, uh, the, the, the synapses are firing and they tend to embrace uncertainty. Um, so you're also dealing with these cognitive um, differences in people where so- certain people tend to be more about certainty and stability and predictability, whereas other people tend to be more attracted to the uncertainty that comes with, say, working in that disruptive innovation space. So if you take a person who thinks conservative and put them in that space, then they're probably going to struggle and there's going to be all sorts of cognitive dissonance. So we're dealing with a lot more than just saying, hey, be innovative, throw some beanbags around the, the office, let's come up with ideas and put some sticky notes on the wall and, and we'll be innovative just like Facebook. Yeah, no, exactly. It's, 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 it's moving away from the one size fits all approach to pretty much anything that a corporation is doing, right? So they, they, they take standardization to another level, which I understand I understand is necessary, right? Mm. They need to manage costs. It's, it's, complex. It's, it's a complex organization, right? So standardization 
standardization that actually helps, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, like as I, as I said earlier, being uh, being efficient is no longer efficient, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? So so um, we need we need to start 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 aiming for efficacy, right? Are we having an impact? So so start moving away from one size fits all and be able be able to be um, to be as as diverse and as complex and as different as the environment you're trying to to, to manage. Right. If if the outside world in, in in which you're trying to play is very diverse and uh, is very complex, you have to have that complexity represented inside. And, and another thing that people don't 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 uh, or at least I, I think they mistake um, is the fact that uh, they say managers manage people. Well, we're totally totally wrong because the the job of a manager is not to manage individuals. The job of a manager is to manage a system. Right, so so you can you can you can put a manager in, in in place to run the innovation department or to run an innovation ecosystem in a company or to run innovation process, but oftentimes what they do they revert to the let's say good old with air quotes uh, management um, style of going and managing individuals and that's actually or, or projects right they need to manage the system they need to manage the way in which those people are are doing their job rather than. Uh, rather than the individual itself, manage what what the people are 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 experiencing in terms of processes, in terms of KPIs, rather than the actual work that they do. Yes, definitely. And I think you know we need to think complexly about complex problems. Um, Occam's razor only takes us so far in this space. And I guess on management, I mean, a great manager, a great leader, and then those two things aren't always uh, the same. Is about facilitating outcomes rather than command and, and conquer and, and directing from the top because especially when it comes to this space of innovation, um, your entrepreneurial thinkers um, who do embrace the uncertainty, they don't necessarily want to be micromanaged and you can't micromanage um, innovation um, at all. So on this notion of people being different, Dan, um, when it comes to Horizon 1, you mentioned sustainable earlier, uh, Horizon 2 adjacent and then Horizon 3, your more transformational or disruptive innovation. When it comes to the split of people in the organization, I mean, obviously, we don't expect everybody to adopt the Facebook mantra, move fast and break things. What sort of, you know, do you have any sort of views on percentages of people within the organization who play in these different buckets? I mean, every organization should find their own, their <laughs> own special blend of, uh, of the free horizons, if you want. Um, obviously, literature, popular literature, put, to put forward the idea of 70, 20, 10. But uh, that's not set in stone. So I think every every company should find their own their own blend, and also they need to find their own blend given the environment that they play in. If if they know their core is getting disrupted tomorrow, probably 70, 20, 10 is not going to keep them in business in the next ten years. Yeah. So they probably need to go with 10, 20, 70. Mm. But if they are if they're an industry which looks quite quite stable for the for the foreseeable future at least, 70, 20, 10 or 80, 10, 10 might uh, might might be a good uh, might be a good plan. Again, I think everybody should create their own mix. There, they should brew their own uh, their own innovation uh, uh, ambition, if you want. Yeah. And um, again, always have to be looking outside the window rather than in the mirror. So always be looking outside and understanding the the factors that that drive their their uh, their need for for that blend rather than just looking inside and and try to play play the game. Yeah, and that, that's a, a good point to make that every organization is different. So just looking at what's happening in, say, in Silicon Valley and going to tour Google's offices and saying, okay, Google's doing this, so let's do the same thing because you could be in a different country, a different industry, different regulator, different types of people, different size company, different products. Like there's so many different things that you're dealing with that it's, it's not enough to just say, okay, this company is doing it, so let's do that and we'll be successful as well. Yeah, I think I think they need to look more at the system rather than uh, rather than the actual figures and the actual artifacts, right? A lot of people import the idea of post-it notes and beanbags after a trip to Silicon Valley without actually importing the the mindset behind uh, behind the the use of the post-it note, right? Yeah, it's basically cargo culting, right? For the people that are familiar with the concept. Yes, I wrote an article about cargo cults a while ago, and uh, for our audience, that's where you had these native villages, and uh, you'd have foreign visit, I think it was about 200 years ago, and, and, and the foreign white man would visit on aeroplanes, and they would then bring food with them and all sorts of stuff. Then they'd leave, 
And the local villagers thought, well, if we can just create these aeroplanes out of, say, wood, um, then we'll somehow make it rain food and all sorts of stuff. And I may be getting the story a little bit wrong, but ultimately they mistook um, where the food was coming from with these objects. And they thought that yeah. they could just build wooden planes and that they would fly and, and, and that they'd be uh, full of fruit yeah. for, for the summer. <laughs> they, they were not understanding how food is made. Yeah or how rifles were made, or how some of the objects were made, but they were just looking at the artifacts that were bringing those items. So the airplanes, the, the gestures that, that, the, that the ground personnel was making. And in the same way, people go to Silicon Valley and they say, oh yeah, hula shirts and shorts and, and Converse and beanbags and, and post-it notes, and the gods of innovation will descend upon us. Yeah, it's very, very surface level. And um, one thing that I do like about your book that goes counter against those surface level uh, obsessions is the focus on metrics and metrics, not just across the product, but across the governance level, as well as the global um, level, which focuses on helping the company examine the overall performance of their investment and innovation. But not only that, it also breaks things down um, between activity and impact metrics. Um, which I think is an important distinction, but why don't you tell our audience why that's such an important distinction? Well, well one one is basically one one is basically the activity that that the product team is performing, right? So you're measuring against uh, against what they're actually doing, and the other one you're measuring the product team or that particular activity against the output, right, or desired output, right? So it's it's, it's one thing to perform the gestures, another thing to actually get results. Mm-hmm. Because if there's a disconnect in between the gestures you perform and the results you get, probably the gesture was not fitting with the end goal. Plus, it's always very good to have the people, you know, with their with their with their with their eyes on the ball, right? Always play for 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 the ball, and the ball is the impact that you're trying to create, right? So so rather than focusing on on creating the gesture, like asking how many interviews you've done, you better start asking them on on what the interviews need to deliver. And then you probably realize that in some cases, interviews are not necessarily the thing they need to do. Again, I'm overly simplifying the concepts now in, in this conversation, but I'm just using uh, super trivial examples for people to, to, to rely better to, to what we're talking about. But that's basically the, the difference between, uh, between the, the, two, the two types. Yeah, and, and I think a, a simple example I see all the time is just counting things like uh, inputs, like the number of ideas raised um, in, in an idea challenge or something to that effect and saying, well, we had hundreds of ideas, this was successful, but then maybe taking it a step further and saying, well, of these ideas, how many uh, turned into, say, experiments? And of those experiments, how many assumptions were validated? And of those validated assumptions, how many uh, sign-ups did we subsequently get for the first version of this low-fidelity product? Like putting it down that funnel, not just stopping at the very top of the funnel with those input metrics such as ideas. Exactly. I, that's, that's exactly the word I was about to use. Create, create a funnel, like, like a sales funnel or whatever, whatever funnel, funnel you'd like mm-hmm. to, to be able to understand what's going on in, in your ecosystem. It's very great. It's, it's very good that you, you have those 100 ideas. It's actually great. But the thing is, if, if there's nothing happening downstream with those, they are pretty much worthless. And not just worthless, and not just worthless, because they would have been worthless, that's good. But the problem is that in, in, in most companies, they create frustrations with the people that, are, uh, that, that created those ideas, right? So if there's 100 people generating 100 ideas and, and none of those ideas get implemented, they will get disillusioned. Those 100 people will get disillusioned with, 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 with the company. And some of them will leave, will be like, hell, you know what I created? I, I, I've been in, the, in your idea challenge two years ago, and I've been last year, and I'm, I'm coming this year again. My ideas are selected, but they're never implemented. So the hell with it. I'm just going to go and found my own startup based on one of the free ideas I created for you guys in the past three years. Yeah. And yeah, you're, you're going to have competition. Yeah, yeah. No, no, look, you, you're, you're, speaking, you're speaking my language. And I think that's another fantastic point because um, the whole uh, – tendency for organizations to confuse action with effectiveness does become detrimental after a while because you do, like you said, you lose your best people, your most entrepreneurial people, and they're the people that you should be striving to keep at the organization today. They're the people that you need now more than you did, say, 10 years ago. So while you might think you're doing something good by running this challenge and whatnot, if you don't put the critical thinking into it, if you don't think about what are the the impact metrics, not just the input metrics, then it can come at a massive cost. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, hundred percent. So, 
the book, you've interviewed a number of people. So it's not just uh, yourself and your co-author, but you've interviewed people such as um, Lean Startup Coach uh, Tristan Cromer, Ole Madsen from Spa Nordbank, and Aaron Eden of Move the Needle. And um, in the book, Aaron introduces the notion of um, lean leadership, which builds on something we touched on a few moments ago, talking about management and what their role is. Um, what's this notion of lean leadership all about? Well, I think I think you should ask uh, Aaron about it. I think I think has a better definition than I do. Uh, I, I think I think uh, Aaron and his work in moves the needle. Uh, I mean, he's he's an HR guru, right? He, Aaron comes from from an HR background. I have a lot of respect for him and also for for his uh, uh, for his co-founder Brad Cooper and uh, great great individuals. Uh, I, I think. They're they're doing amazing work when it comes to capability development. And capability development is not just training the workforce, but also trying to to train managers, trying to take managers to be able to communicate with that with that newly trained workforce. And um, I've been I've been seeing this. Uh, I've been actually experimenting with this uh, initially in 2013. I was tasked to teach a couple of product teams to do to do uh, lean startup, right, mm-hmm. and an agile and agile development. So I did train them and I spent quite some time with those teams and they were starting performing experiments. I was really proud of them. But being being in, in a corporation and uh, being employed by a corporation, these teams at one point need to go to management and ask for new budgets or, you know, like they have to go to those meetings or those review boards. And uh, they were basically entering there with all their experiment data and all of the things that they've done and all the sprints they run and whatnot. All of the, all of the, all of the product teams that went there, having used that methodology, were, were uh, discontinued. So the management didn't want to invest in them. And of course, I went, I went to the management afterwards and I asked them, like, What's the problem? Why, why, why did you decide not to invest in those ideas and you decided to invest in ideas which are totally outrageous with no data, with like no evidence that they're actually going to work? Uh, it, it turned out that they were not trained. Mm. So basically, basically what was happening in, in, in the essence, what was happening, one, one group of individuals was speaking one language and the other group of individuals was speaking a totally different language. And unless you're actually trying to have the both groups speak the same language, nothing is going to move. Because one, one person is going to ask for an ROI, the other one is going to just, just going to show experiment data. And of course, there's a major disconnect. And I, and I think what, what, what Moves the Needle is doing and what, what Aaron is talking about there, uh, they're talking about bridging this gap, this communication gap between, between leadership, which needs to have the same agile mindset as uh, as the as agile mindset, I mean not doing the proper agile methodology, but having that iterative mindset, if you want, right? So leadership having that iterative decision uh, de- decision mindset in terms of how they take decisions, how they evaluate teams, the same one as as the teams do. So whenever a team is reporting on experiment data on on the, on the things that they've learned in, in their last sprint, management understands that language. Management is able to provide that leadership needed for needed for that idea to move forward. Yeah, and you, you definitely need to align the, the not only the language but the the metrics, the values, the processes. If everybody's not on the same page, then it is like playing a, a game of tug of war and it's going to take uh, what's well, going to be a very uphill battle to get anything done. And, you know, um, I think it was in the innovators dilemma where they talk about the alignment of resources, processes, and values. Um, I mean, if you train people in lean startup, but you don't update the innovation ecosystem or update the plumbing so people can actually experiment and gain access to budget and time to try things, then it's almost pointless. Um, so I guess based on your work in the in the space, I mean, what are some things you've seen across, say, resources or processes that are, say, ultimately holding organizations back? Some of the key things, like whether it's incentives that are misaligned or the use of a business case to funnel ideas through. I mean, what are some of the key things you see pop up all the time that are just holding companies back? I think one of the biggest ones is it's actually budgeting. Mm-hmm. So the fact that that all these corporations still do still do annual planning for for their budget and and that's that's a massive massive problem when it comes to innovation and and some of them actually realize they need to move away from that. There's there are several banks in Europe that uh, are are now moving to 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 rolling forecasts right to rolling budgets every every quarter so they no longer do the the year planning um, and uh, that's the, the reason behind it is that once once you embark on the journey of building a product, 
um, in in the current in the current budgeting system, you get uh, the the whole lump sum of money up front, and you need to to burn it, mm-hmm. right? In say six months, eight months, one year. Uh, whether in a new system, which will probably be aligned with uh, with the process that you have in order in order to bring that idea to market. Uh, you're basically doing what what Eric is talking about metered funding in, uh, in in his book, right? So it's basically you're, you're basically applying the the VC model, where where whenever there's evidence for for um, for something that that product the team has uncovered, they get more money, and then when they bring more evidence, they get even more money, and and basically it's the VC model, right? So in 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 uh, in the startup world, you go from from angel, then you go you go to seed round, and then you go to round A, to round B, to round C. Pretty much the same approach needs needs to needs needs to take place in um, in um, in, a, in a large organization. I think this is the biggest problem I've I've heard executives that I've worked with. Um, this is the biggest problem that they're facing is trying to create and try to shape budgeting in um, to to fit the new process of of business building. And there there's ways to do it, right? You can you can go all out and and destroy your entire uh, budgeting system. You can do that, or you can just create a pool of money for uh, for innovation, right? To create a fund that is managed by by an executive by by one of the by one of the C guys, mm-hmm. and um, he or she is sitting on on that money and is managing it like like a VC would. So you're still on one side. Your organization is still doing their their annual planning for for core and whatnot. But they put this lump sum away, and this lump sum is being dripped to 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 the to the ideas in in a VC style metered funding, basically. Yeah, yeah, and and I guess again that fund and the success of that fund, at least in the early stages, the metrics that you use to evaluate that are different to the metrics you use to evaluate right. um, the organization's performance as a whole. And um, you mentioned there uh, the startup funding pu- uh, funnel from Angel to Series A, B, C, D, and so on. And um, I guess there's a massive misconception, at least from where I'm standing, uh, when it comes to senior executives and their perceptions of innovation, they think it's risky, it's going to cost a lot of money, we're not going to get a return on investment. But as far as this BC funnel is concerned within a large organization, like that equivalent angel round doesn't need to be $200,000. Maybe it could be even in some cases a hundred or $500 just to seed the idea and just to try and validate that there is a customer problem worth solving there. Going going back to the metaphor I just gave earlier with uh, with the with the lottery tickets, right? So you, if 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 somebody is asking for five hundred thousand euros or two hundred thousand euros, right? Instead of giving them five hundred thousand euros, ask them what they can do with fifty, and then and then multiply it by ten, and then come up with ten ideas mm-hmm. to which you're giving you're you're, you're giving fifty thousand, and now your odds of success just just multiplied by five. Yeah, and you actually and you actually haven't spent more money, you actually spent less. Yeah, you spend, right. Reducing, reducing your cost of failure, basically. Yeah, you, you reduce your cost of failure, but you also get a lot of learnings, and potentially those learnings are something that may seed another idea. It's like, hey, we did this. Our initial ideas was basically flawed, but here's something that we learned that we weren't expecting. Um, and not only that, by doing that, you are then empowering your people across the organization to try different things, to experiment. And then over time, um, you're also helping to shift the culture as a byproduct of supporting that sort of process. Right. For 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 the skeptics in that in that space, I encourage them to compute what's their cost of insight, mm-hmm. right? If if you're a skeptic of the of of the of the iterative mindset movement, right, including lean, agile, and and design thinking, and just just try to figure out how much you've spent for the insights you've gotten, and could you have spent less to get the same exact uh, insights? Yeah. Or, right? So. Try, try to divide how much you spent on that last product that didn't work, how much you've learned from that in terms in terms of the market and how it behaved and customer insight and whatnot, and and see what's the cost per insight and then and then try to compare it with what would be the cost of insight for for somebody that was just running one experiment and you're going to realize that you're actually paying exponentially less. Yeah, and that's a very worthwhile exercise for organizations to embark on, especially you know. <sighs> Taking the traditional approach to product development that so many companies do, there's no shortage of case studies where organizations have spent tens of, if not hundreds, if not millions of dollars um, trying to take something to market that ultimately failed. And then if you uh, retrospectively say, well, let's take this back and let's apply Lean Startup. What were our key assumptions here? How could we have tested them? How much would that have costed uh, to learn that this wasn't going to work? And you might find that it would have been like one 
fiftieth of what you ended up spending um, to learn the same thing. True, true. I think I think it's going to be very interesting if people if you go down that road. I mean, one of the first things I do with with my clients whenever whenever I onboard somebody else, they're like, please compute your cost of failure. Mm-hmm. It's basically this cost of insight, right? Like, I, yeah. I want to know how. I mean, I want you to know. Uh, how much? How much did uh, did did product development cost you last year, or two years ago, or three years ago? And that's basically our benchmark, yeah. right? That's our benchmark moving forward. Like that, that's that's we we need to be better than that. And obviously, you realize that depending on industry, sometimes you end up with with cost of failure of like two million something euros. And, Mm. You'd be like, well, I'm sure we can improve from two million. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. And there's, there's the other side of that, which is um, when you're trying to get buy-in from senior executives, asking the question, well, how much are you willing to lose in this instance? And they may say, well, I need ten thousand dollars. Great, we can do a hell of a lot with ten thousand dollars if we apply or if we look at it through the right lens. Exactly, exactly. The ten thousand dollars go a long way, independent on 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 the country you're in. You can be in Norway, or you can be in Vietnam, you can be in Australia, or you can be in Russia. Ten thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars that can get you a long way in terms in terms of insight. Obviously, it's very dependent on on the industry. So if you're like in pharma or aerospace, probably ten thousand dollars is not going to be much. But if you're in pretty much any other industry, I mean, they they can get you a long way to getting some really good insights. Yeah. Definitely couldn't agree more. Well, Dan, it looks like you've been thinking about this topic for a number of years now and you're quite passionate about it. And um, for those, uh, for listeners of the show who are in Australia, uh, Dan will be speaking at the Innovators Summit in Sydney um, in late September. So what will you be speaking about at the summit, Dan? It's a very good question. I haven't yet figured it out. Uh, it's, it's probably going to be something around the idea of creating an ecosystem, right? So talking about talking about the discipline discipline uh, when it comes to innovation practice, talking about the discipline when it comes to investments, uh, talking about governance, talking about being pragmatic when it comes to innovation, treat, treating innovation as as a management discipline rather than just uh, just just a fluffy word. Colored post-its on on a post-it uh, on, on on a whiteboard, right? Yeah. I'm also gonna do gonna do a uh, an event for for the community in Brisbane. So if people can't attend Sydney, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be in Brisbane in uh, in beginning of October, and um, hopefully some of some of the listeners can can join that event. Fantastic. Well, um, sh- we'll share the the information offline, and I'll add that to the show notes for our listeners. Um, before we wrap up, Dan. Three questions sure. lying around. Let's kick into it. <laughs> Question number one is, if you could work for any organization at any stage of the company life cycle, who would it be and why? Whoa. Very good <laughs> question. Well, I, I really I really enjoy what I'm doing now now in Norway, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm helping transform a, a large financial institution here, here in Oslo. So uh, I'm very close to, to my ideal place. Although, to be honest with you, I would I would like to work with NASA at one point. Yeah, was this when they were actually launching rockets or <laughs> I mean they're still doing they're still doing some some of the launching. Oh. Yeah, they're not they, I mean their their golden age uh, has passed, but yeah. I think they're still a a reputable company. And um I again it's just you know it's 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 a boys thing, right? You always want to be working with 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 rockets and oh, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Couldn't agree more on that. Um, question number two is a little bit trickier, Dan. It is, if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Whoa, yeah, that's, that's a curveball. That's a curveball <laughs> right there. Um, that's a Haji free kick. <laughs> yeah, 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 right, right, right. Going back to the metaphor from, from the beginning of the, of the, of the show. Well, that's a, that's, that's a tough one. Let me, let me think. Um, I I would probably want to talk with one of my favorite authors, and that's that's Hemingway. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know what I will ask him. I mean, it's uh, it's a very very good question. If I would have Hemingway in front of me now, um, I'll, I'll probably ask him like, what was the book that 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 changed changed him? Mm. Right? What was the what was the book that had the the highest impact on on him? I'm I'm a very big fan. I read. So many of his novels, also the the short stories. So uh, I think that's that's a question that I would that would ask. 
Yeah, that's a very insightful question. Um, I think just taking that whole concept of modeling yourself on other people, but then who did those people model themselves on? So standing on the shoulders of giants, standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, effectively, which is a great way to look at it. And um, lucky last, this one's a bit easier, Dan. Um, you know, you've been working in the space for a number of years now, helping banks and financial services institutions, such as the one in Norway, on their transformation goals, uh, writing books, appearing on podcasts like this one, and flying around the world, giving keynotes at different conferences. What do you do to stay on top of your game? I read. Read? <laughs> I, I, what I read at the I, moment? Uh, what I'm reading, I'm, I'm actually finishing. I'm, I'm in, the, in the last pages now of a book uh, called Clarity First. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's Karen Martin. She's a guru from, from the lean, uh, lean manufacturing movement. Very brilliant person. I would love to, to, actually, to actually meet her and, and, and talk with her. So, so actually, before meeting Hemingway, I'd like to, to meet Karen Martin and just uh, chat with her. Very, very, very bright person. Fantastic. We'll add that to the show notes for our listeners. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for giving up some time to appear on the show. I think you've left us with a hell of a lot of value and a lot of food for thought for our, in particular, our corporate uh, innovation executives and executives listening to the show. Um, if people want to link up with you, they can find you on LinkedIn, on Twitter at Danto underscore Ma. Um, your website is Danto.ma. And of course, they can pick up a copy of the corporate startup on Amazon. Is there any Parting words of wisdom for our audience, Dan. No, just uh, stay lean and keep doing innovation in the right way. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Thank you. Hi, guys. Steve again. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to receive a weekly email from me, complete with reflections, books I've been reading, words of wisdom, and access to blogs, ebooks, and more that I'm publishing on a regular basis, just leave your details at futuresquared.xyz forward slash subscribe, and you'll receive the very next one. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. You can catch me on Twitter at Steve Gubeski and on Instagram at TheSteveGubeski. Until next time, hasta la vista, baby.